the book of Revelation, chapter 13. We were in chapter 13 last week. And I said at the beginning we would not finish chapter 13. We will, hopefully, the good Lord willing, uh, we will finish up chapter 13 tonight. This is lesson 19, if you're keeping track. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole of chapter 13. That way it has some flow to it. But we'll, we really stopped at about verse 10 last week, and then we're going to continue on. All right. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and this deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast. Remember, there's three beasts that we talked about. Another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So where are we at in this reading? We are about in the middle of the tribulation period, uh, somewhere between the seventh trumpet and the first vial. So there's a large interlude or parentheses, we sometimes say that, uh, which really runs from Revelation chapter 12 or into chapter 14. So there's kind of a, a halt in the proceedings, not that everything stops. What is happening on the earth, we're not seeing that picture. Usually we'll see that the Lord is doing some other things uh, in heaven or uh, other things are being described that are not happening on the earth. Last time we talked about the first beast, which consisted of the Antichrist as well as the beast system. Uh, if you remember those ten nations that we talked about that were under the reign and the authority of the Antichrist. Uh, so that is a part of the beast system, the governmental system that is included with that. So as we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, who is this second beast or this other beast that we are looking at? It says, exercises power or control or authority over the first beast. So this beast comes uh, up out of the earth. This beast that has the deadly wound uh, is the Antichrist. The head being wounded could possibly describe the Antichrist being killed and maybe raised back uh, to life, or at least we talked about that it may look like that 
is what happened because it says as if ye had been killed. So the second beast goes along with the Antichrist. He has power uh, to make things happen with the uh, Antichrist. He goes along with him. He exercises power, uh, much like the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is not alone. He has 10 nations, and he has a companion that is able to duplicate his power and support everything that he does. So we have not just one beast, but now we're talking about the second beast. For the sake of maybe helping us understand what's going on here, if you look in the Old Testament at Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh and they're saying, you know, that famous line, let my people go, that they may go and worship the Lord their God. And what happens is, there's also a group in the court of Pharaoh, and you may remember this, and they're magicians. They practice deceptive wonders that speak of Pharaoh's being, being in charge, being in control. So they're, they're pointing back to Pharaoh. And this beast that we're seeing here is kind of like that in that it points back to the Antichrist. And this second beast is a religious power. So the second beast is what many people call the false prophet. How many by raising of hands have heard of the false prophet? The false prophet uh, will introduce the mark of the beast. It is not the Antichrist that introduces the mark of the beast, but the false prophet that does so. So as you look at this, how many sees things that are similar to the way God's government works and the way God operates? We talked about that a lot last week because the enemy likes to imitate, mimic, if you will, mock, if you uh, like to hear that, uh, what God does. So here we see that Satan is doing that. He's mimic mimicking things, doing things like God would do, except it is twisted or evil. Uh, he's doing it in his own way. That's what the devil is doing. How many knows that we, we call God the Trinity? You heard the term Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? Holy Ghost, however uh, you're raised to say that. God is a Trinity. He is God, one God, manifested in three persons is the way uh, I was taught how to say that. Here we see Satan trying to mimic God, and he sets himself up as a Trinity, but it's a satanic Trinity. So the Trinity is the dragon. The dragon is literally the devil. You have the Antichrist, and you have the false prophet. So that is the Trinity that we are uh, seeing here, the, the Satanic Trinity. The devil wants to take the place of God, and it operates in this. The devil wants to take the place of God. The Antichrist, who does he want to take the place of? Christ, and then finally the false prophet wants to take the place of the Holy Spirit. So you see all of these in action, they are anti-God, therefore you have anti-Christ, you have the false prophet, you have the dragon, which is the devil, uh, all of these operate, operate. So when you look at the second beast, the second beast, which is mentioned in verse 11, has two horns like a lamb. What is the significance in the Bible of a lamb? Sacrifice? It's always, a lamb's always a religious figure, right? Uh, you have the lamb of God, right? Who was, bore the sins of mankind, who was crucified for us. But you also have things like the lamb or even the ram in the thicket that saved Isaac from being mortally wounded and killed and sacrificed. So it is a religious symbol, if you would. So this beast has two horns like a lamb, but it's not a lamb. Remember that the devil does everything to look like something, but be something else. And this lamb uh, is a religious connotation, as we talked about. 
It is there to deceive the people. This is a religious figure. Two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like what? Like a dragon. And that's going to be a weird looking and sounding figure, right? Two horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Uh, I don't know how dragons speak. I don't, you know, you watch those Disney uh, movies that have dragons and they're friendly and they fly and they do all these other things, but this is not that kind of dragon. So he speaks like a dragon and he derives his power from the dragon or the devil. So he deceives man or men by acting like he's a lamb, but speaking with the words of Satan. And he attempts to duplicate everything that God does. The devil is a deceiver, right? He is the father of lies. He is the accuser of the brethren, is what the Bible says. And how does he accuse you? He falsely accuses you. Because he should be able to accuse you at all. Because what? As a Christian, you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. And the Bible tells us, I, when I was preaching this, I mean, feeling real good. I talked about how we can go boldly before the throne, not in our own righteousness, but because of the blood of Christ, right? We can go boldly before the throne. And so the, the enemy is trying to duplicate everything of God. Here is some speculation. And I, say, I have to say this is speculation. Though many in time pastors, preachers, teachers, those who study this believe that this could very well be what happens, but it is believed that the false prophet will more than likely be the head of the apostate church. So it will be, he will lead a world religion, but it will be apostate. And so what does that apostate mean? It means it's not truly following God, right? It's different. It is uh, anti-God and anti-government of God, and so uh, you see that you see that happening. So it's a church that really isn't a church, not the way we think of. It. And this prophet is—he speaks. Notice he speaks. That's why we call it a false prophet because he is speaking. This figure that looks has horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. It speaks prophetic words and tries to act like God. Can I tell you that people look for signs and wonders? We are Pentecostal. We talk about signs and wonders. There's nothing wrong with signs and wonders unless that's all you're looking for. Jesus scolded the Pharisees and the Israelites and all of those because Every time he, he would do miracle after miracle, it's always amazed me. You read the Gospels, he's doing all kinds of great, wonderful miracles, healing people, telling a man to stretch out his hand and it, it, it had been withered and it comes you know, back as normal, all this kind of stuff. And they say, would you show us a sign? It's like, duh, what did you just see? If all we are in this for is a sign, we can be fooled. Now, I'm not saying that Christians, we believe they're gone, they're raptured. But how many knows that the spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well, right? It's here, it's in operation. When you look for a pastor, a church, some church to fellowship with, don't just look for signs. Look and make sure that you're preaching the true word of God. Make sure there's love in the house, right? Make sure, you know, all, all these things that we know to be the litmus test is this of God, right? Not just signs. And so we have to be careful that we aren't doing that. So you see all kinds of attempts by Satan to duplicate what God does. The week before, we were going back and forth between Revelation chapter 13, chapter 17, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. But here's an example of Satan trying to duplicate. How many knows that we are called the bride of Christ? We're his 
pride, his beloved, the Bible says. Well, guess what Satan has? The whore of Satan. You find that in chapter 17. There is a duplication of what God's trying to do, but it's an evil and a twisted way that uh, the enemy is trying to do that. Here we see the false prophet exercising authority, uh, the authority of the Antichrist. There's cooperation between the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. I wonder why the church sometimes isn't in cooperation like it ought to be. I mean, you see here in the end times that the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet are all working cooperatively to deceive the world and to take them down. It ought to speak to us that we need to work in cooperation with one I'm not saying we aren't. I'm saying the church as a whole, sometimes it's, well, this is my church, and I'm just going to worry about my church. And it's not competition. We're in this thing together. We need the Baptist and the Methodist and the, uh, all of those different denominations. And some of the doctors are not unity. That's, that's true. And while I teach what I believe, if you notice, especially in the book of Revelation, I'm saying this is what we believe is happening. Because it's not a foundational thing. If it is not a foundational thing, like you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe that he died for our sins and that he was a spotless sacrifice for us. There's just some things that are not negotiable, right? Uh, but some of the doctrines... I think when you get to heaven and find out that everybody was wrong. I mean, you know, the, the Pentecostals were wrong, the Baptists were wrong, the Methodists were wrong, the Episcopalians were wrong. Everybody was wrong. It's okay if it doesn't keep us out of heaven, right? Uh, the only thing that will keep us out of heaven is if we don't have the blood of Christ applied to our life. To say that, when we look at the devil's kingdom, it is number one, Organized. Number two, it is united. They have a common purpose. And here's where we have to go with this, and I'm trying to go with this. It's okay if we don't agree on everything, but we need to have a common goal and believe that we're all going to the same place. And that common goal is what Jesus Christ came to the earth to do, to seek and to save the lost. That is A number one in my opinion. Uh, at, at once we're saved, once we've had the blood applied, that's one of the A number one things that we need to be doing. That's why on Sunday, we're gonna go right back there again this Sunday, I'm teaching about how to uh, witness, how to evangelize, how to use your relationships with people to bring them to Christ. It is so, so important. Sometimes as Pentecostals, we're emphasizing miracles and all kinds of things and leaving out salvation. Shame on us if we do that. And that's why you're going to see me, uh, and the Lord just came to me this year and said, hey, it's going to be a focus. Why? Because he's coming back. So look at verse 13. This uh, false prophet, second beast, whatever you want to call it, is doing great wonders. And he's able to call, even call fire down from heaven in the sight of men. He's also doing other kinds of miracles that would deceive men. And this is what we were talking about. People want to see miracles. I want to see miracles. I want to see God do great miracles. We think sometimes, oh, if there was just this miracle that nobody could deny, that everybody would get saved. Well, that's not true. Biblically, it doesn't show that. Now, do I want to see signs and wonders? And would some people be believed because of that? Yeah, the Bible says that some will. But even the chosen people of God, all of them didn't. Most of them didn't because of the sign. How much more evidence do you need than the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night and 
and God drowning your enemy in the Red Sea and, and you know, all these things, but yet they're still rebellious, still human, still, yeah, yeah, they're still like us. So as we look at this beast, uh, this false prophet, he says, hey, I've got an idea. We need to make an image of the first beast, of the beast, and worship it. That's why we say that this second beast is a religious character. He's all about making an image and worshiping it, as exhorting people to worship the beast. What about these miracles? Are they real miracles? I believe the devil has some powers. Or are they what you would find in 2 Thessalonians? And this is not on your questions, but I wanted to bring it up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 talk about these kinds of miracles being lying wonders. Is the devil using deception to make people believe that this these great miracles are happening, fire coming out from it, all this kind of stuff? Could be. Obviously, the devil does do that. He is a, a great deceiver. As Kate was talking about, there's all kinds of technology already here. I, I like some Disney movies. Some, they have some dark sides to them. But their animation is amazing. I mean, you go to Disneyland, I remember a ride that was, you know, Space Mountain, all those guys. I mean, it looks like, wow, we're going through, you know, outer space here. I mean, it looks amazing. Now, all that animation and everything is the devil using technology. Does he use technology? I would say yes, he absolutely does. The enemy does have power, but his power pales in comparison. And that's the, that's the thing we have to keep uh, in mind as we look at this. This image is made to the beast. If you go back to Matthew chapter 24, it calls, it really is, I believe it's calling this the abomination of desolation. This image to the beast and this worship of the beast uh, and in the temple, I believe that is what is ref referred to in Matthew chapter 24. So last week we went to chapter 2 and 7 of Daniel. If you go to chapter 3, you have a story, and you probably remember this, of Nebuchadnezzar having an image set up of him that was to be what? Worshipped. I mean, remember that great story of the three Hebrew children who would not bow down. Uh, we're told we're going to give you one more chance and we're going to play the music. And by the way, the enemy uses music as well. So God's music is better and more powerful and it does lead us into worship. But the enemy will use things of God that God really owns. Can I say it like that? To try to deceive people. When the music plays, they said, you bow down and you worship this image and then we won't throw you in the fiery furnace. Of course, we know that they didn't. And they're thrown in the fiery furnace so hot that it kills the, the, the guards that are throwing them into the, this fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he says, didn't we throw three in there? But I see one and he is as like unto the son of man. Man, I've been studying all about the son of man over the last few weeks as I'm trying to write a paper. What did he see? He saw Jesus in the fire with them. What an amazing thing. Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image of himself and it is a display of his power, his majesty, and his kingdom. You see what's happening that the Antichrist and the false prophet are doing? They're showing, hey, I've got the power and the majesty, it's my kingdom, and you're to worship. What's significant about this? I would say that Satan's biggest desire is to get you and I to worship him. We see in the Old Testament where, it's, where he is saying to God, it's like a rehearsal of what happened before Satan's kicked out of heaven. I will arise. 
I will go to the highest heights and I will set myself upon the throne. And why does he want to be on the throne? Because he wants to be worshipped. And he wants you and I to worship him because he knows God won't. Because we are God's highest creation. And if he can get us to fall, he knows he's done something. So in this final state of the apostasy, what's going on, the focal point is, is going to be worship of the beast. And as I said before, we believe that the devil himself will go into the temple in the body of the Antichrist and tell everyone there that he is God and that he is to be worshipped. That's what we believe uh, will happen. There'll probably also be a sacrifice of a pig on the altar uh, because we know that happened historically. I mean, knows that history repeats itself sometimes. I'm not saying, the Bible doesn't say that's what's going to be, but it could very well be that because that's what happened at one point in history. Uh, early uh, in the second or third century, I can't remember now, my uh, Christian history is escaping me right now. So. so how is all of this possible? How are they going to worship this image? Is it because of these lying wonders, religious deception, the Bible tells us that in the last days, people will depart from the faith. And these are not Christians, so they're going to easily depart from what they've been taught about God. So they're going to depart from the faith, and they're going to believe what they have known, and they're going to believe a lie. The Bible really tells us that if we continue to mess with God and don't heed his call for us, that he can even turn us over to a reprobate mind then we won't be able to even go back to God I mean I haven't remember said the Bible saying that. there is a spirit of deception it's very hard to find the truth because where is the warfare happening it is in information how do you even determine what is true and what is not these days it's very difficult I can tell you it's God's word. That's for sure. I told a young man the other day he needed to get off Facebook and start reading the Bible. Because his mind was not processing and understanding things that he should understand because it had been warped by listening to too much Facebook and too many. There's a lot of weird stuff out there, folks. You can get trapped in it if you don't watch what you're doing. Stay in the Word. Uh, stay in your church. You know, all, all of that. So for those who don't worship the beast, just like those who didn't fall down and worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, there's a very high price to pay uh, in this day that we're looking at. They'll pay the price of their life. They'll be saved for eternity, but they will pay a price with their life. Uh, if they don't worship this beast. This second beast, false prophet, whatever you want to call it, will cause the world to receive a mark in their hand or in their forehead. We call it the mark of the beast. When you talk about the mark of the beast, it is one of the most well-known prophecies ever. People who don't know anything about the Bible have a tendency to know something about the mark of the beast. It's true. And this technology is here. The Bible talks a whole lot about it. What is it all about? What is the mark of the beast before we talk about how it's already possibly the technology is here? The mark of the beast is instituting a worldwide economic system that will be in effect during the end times. So it is a worldwide economic system. Let me throw out some terms. Have you heard these terms? One world economy. One world government. One world currency. All of those things. We talked last week about the European, what used to be called the common market, now European Union. What is the purpose of it? One 
economy, one for a geographic region, all of Europe, essentially. Let's just say when the church gets raptured, they're not have to worry about the technology to make this happen. It's already here. Uh, like I said, Europe has already done something like this. I'm not talking about the mark, but I'm talking about having a one world, one geographic economic system. And just last week, somebody said, well, if we're in the end times, why don't you buy gold or silver? They're not reading their Bible. You cannot buy or sell without the mark. It don't matter if you have gold or silver or bitcoins or whatever. You cannot buy or sell without the mark. That's what the Bible says. You know, there's, there's no getting around it. There's no uh, getting circumventing this system that the enemy uh, it was going to be bringing in. Can't buy or sell checks, credit cards, debit cards, useless. This chip or whatever it is in your hand or forehead will be the only way uh, to do any kind of business. So how would the enemy or the devil know that you don't have the mark of the beast? How's he going to know? I'll give you one example. No, I have card readers. They've been trying to us. I mean, Taking our temperature, they got used to. Everybody got used to pointing a gun right at your forehead. Mm -hmm. You go to a restaurant or you go to anywhere. Even before that, anybody got uh, something bigger than a five dollar bill? What's it got in it? Chip. It's got a magnetic strip in it, and I have been told now this uh, it may not be true, but I believe it is because it was a pretty reliable source. That they can literally drive by your house and tell you how much currency, how much, how many, how much money you have. Now the dollar bill didn't have it in it, or didn't at one point. I don't think it does now. Uh, but they, I, I've been told that they can literally tell how much money you have in your wallet, in your house, whatever it might be. If that technology is already here, there's not going to be. You're not going to be able to slip and slide and hide and. You're not going to get around it. We went on a cruise last week. At the airport, I had to present my passport. When I got off the ship coming back into the States, you don't need that. Because I walk up to this camera, and it goes, beep, yep, that's Brian Roberts. Whoa, I didn't really like that, but you know what I'm saying. The technology for all of this kind of stuff is already in place. And I don't say that to, it shouldn't frighten you. I'm not saying it to frighten you. I'm saying it to enlighten you. And it should help us to know some of these things to help lead people down the path to say, hey, it's, it's, this thing's wrapping up. This, we're in the end times. I, I taught this five years ago. I never imagined five years ago we'd be where we're at today with some of this. And so it just keeps getting closer and closer. And none of this is really new technology that I've talked about, not really. Along with it being an economic system, it is not just a monetary system. I believe it will also be a surveillance system, tracking system to show you where you are. Can I tell you that the government already knows where you are, how much money you have, your address, probably your blood type, all kinds of things. Years ago, the FBI could, if you walked up to someone, they could probably, especially if you ever had a family member that was under investigation, they could tell you all about your whole family tree. I know that to be a fact. You know, you, you won't be able to hide and the, a microchip is about the size of a small seed that can be easily implanted and has been already in somebody's hand or in their forehead. There are companies and these people volunteered to allow it to happen that they implanted a microchip into their people and that's how the people scan into and go to work. That's how they get paid through that. All of those things already happen. Already here, right? It's very interesting, you know what's what's going on, where we're at. 
Uh, and I sure, I'm not the most uh, technical person. I'm sure there's things that is going on right now that will blow all of our minds as far as to understand where are we at in the, this time frame. And the Lord's coming back. And he said he was. So as we look at this, the last verse talks about the mark or the number. And what is that number? 666. 666. Can I tell you that the number in itself is not evil or bad? So, so if you buy something and it costs you $666, don't throw it away. It's not the number that it is the number represents what the name of the beast, the authority and the power is in the name. That's what the Bible tells us. The authority and the power is in the name of Jesus. The authority and the power of this system is in the name or the number of the beast. And that number happens to be 666. Can I tell you that I don't think you will accidentally be able to take the mark and not know it? Really, in, in its essence, it will be proclaiming allegiance to the devil, to the beast, to the system. It won't be accidental that you do it. You're not going to trip and fall and somebody's going to inject this into you. Not to be worried, right, uh, about that kind of thing. But it represents, the, the, the number represents the beast or allegiance to the devil, where does all this come from? Go all the way back to Genesis when Satan deceives Eve. He tells her that they will become like God. When they eat the fruit, they'll become like God. What day was it that man was created? The sixth day. Man's desire was always to be like God. That's where we got in trouble, folks. Eve wasn't convinced until Satan said, you'll be like God. Because she was already saying, well, he told us we shouldn't, we shouldn't do this. But then when he tempted her and said, well, you're going to be like God, then she submitted. So uh, it's in our submission to our own desires, and the enemy uses that to trick us and to take us down paths we shouldn't go. He really does like that. How many knows the enemy uses what you naturally would desire sometimes? And I'm not saying sometimes our natural desires are not godly desires because we're human. It's just interesting to see that this is the number of a man. Six. The number of man three times is the enemy again trying to be like God. Because the number three, six, 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 three times, it's a six. The number of man, three times. I don't know, but there's a lot of symbolism in all of that number. Let's go through the questions real quick. So question number one, what does the second beast have authority to do, according to verse 12? Cause the earth and those who dwell in it, so it's that saying the whole world, uh, to worship the first beast. Question number two. What is the purpose of the signs that are done by the second beast, according to verse 14? To deceive those who dwell on earth, to deceive the people. Question number three. Describe the second beast, according to verse 11. Two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Spoke like a dragon. That's right. Question four. What kind of power was given to the second beast? According to verse 15. That's right. Read life in the first one. Cause it to speak and to kill those who do not worship the image of the beast. Question five. Who will receive the mark? Everybody. Small, great, rich, poor, free, slave. What does that mean? Everybody. Everybody. And if you don't, 
You'll, you'll, you'll be killed. That's right. Question number six. What are you unable to do without the mark? You're not able to buy or sell. Question seven. What is the number of the beast? Six, six, six. 